Hello and welcome back to our home. My name is Pastor David Burkadal. My wife, Reverend Sally Welch, and I are co-producing these series of video streams of Living Water. We're, um, we initially began to uh, bring some word of um, for reflection and comfort uh, and encouragement during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, that pandemic has sort of been eclipsed by the uh, murder of Charles, uh, uh, George Floyd. And uh, we are now just sort of starting again to uh, come to a point where we're considering both uh, at the uh, top of the news. This week, uh, many businesses are reopening, uh, clubs, uh, some barbershops, uh, some businesses will not be allowed to reopen, some are, uh, and some churches are uh, beginning to reopen. Uh, all of this happening in the face of uh, upticks in the numbers of new cases of the coronavirus, particularly in the southern states, uh, now almost two weeks since the Memorial Day holiday when a lot of people just went nuts and went out and forgot entirely that they were living in a pandemic and now uh, are very unfortunately paying the, uh, the cost. Uh, we're at a time now when we are able to reflect on what it means to open the church. And I, I, I'm thinking that uh, in addition to the steps that churches are taking to keep their people safe, this is a good time now for the church as a whole to reflect on what it means to be the church, not just what we, we do to uh, accommodate the new normal, but who we are as we reopen the church and how we present ourselves to the world. When I retired uh, almost two years ago, uh, now it hardly seems, yes, uh, possible that, that that's happened, but uh, it's gone by quickly. Uh, but for that first six months, uh, I was a nomad I went to a different church every Sunday to worship. Uh, I uh, uh, mostly, the, the largest number was Lutheran, but uh, I went to a wide variety of churches. And one of the things that, that impressed me um, as I reflected on, on that time was that there were many churches, uh, most churches in which I sat there reflecting that I could see why someone would join this church. Uh, the presentation of the ministry of the church were revolved around its programs. It had a great uh, music program or uh, a great educational program or had a great pastor, uh, great sermons, uh, something that the church did. But I, I could not find uh, any indication of why a person would come to Christ. There seemed to be an assumption that if you were in that church, you were already a Christian. And, and uh, conscious or unconscious, it, it seemed to me that uh, that was a, a something that, that really stood out to me as an overall um, condition of most of the lives of, of most of our churches. Uh, I read a book uh, some time ago called uh, The Rise of Christianity. I want to get that to them in a minute, but uh, I was, I've been thinking about that a lot in connection with uh, uh, the idea that the church is called to proclaim the good news, to, to go and make disciples, that's the, to baptize, that's the great commission uh, to Jesus's, uh, Jesus's followers. Uh, how do we do that? How do we convey that as our central reality, the uh, good news of reconciliation with God through Christ at the cross, Christ who's fully God and fully uh, human being? One way, I think, is to reflect on how the church did it in, in the beginning. The church uh, of Jesus Christ began from a group of 12 frightened uh, and disheartened followers uh, that uh, were empowered on the day, literally uh, the day of Pentecost when they received the Holy Spirit, the power of God, the ongoing presence of God's power for good in the world, and, and began to, to tell people about Jesus. And the church grew uh, uh, for the next three centuries. Uh, to a point where it was large enough to take notice and be persecuted, and then became the official religion of the Roman Empire. How did, how did that happen? I think there's something, some lesson in there that we might be able to emulate in these times. I also uh, wonder about uh, churches reopening in these final days, we hope, of the uh, coronavirus pandemic and these early days of uh, sort of reawakening uh, to the church of the need for racial justice in, in our country and, and the church's role in, uh, in fostering that justice uh, for uh, all people, but particularly the African-American people of our, of our country. 
uh, and I'm speaking now as a white person, when we speak of the church, uh, the black church has been a source of inspiration for all people all over the world. And, and the, 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 the church, which has its same uh, content and its same um, inspiration, is, I think, uh, the thing that can bind us together better than anything else in, in our culture. When I was in the Marine Corps, I was stationed uh, in uh, Virginia for some time. And at uh, one point uh, during my sojourn there, uh, we uh, received a new sergeant. A new sergeant was transferred into our unit. He had been uh, moved from Paris Island. Uh, he had been uh, told he could no longer be a drill instructor uh, after being charged with 27 counts of maltreatment of recruits. Yeah, he was so bad he couldn't be a drill instructor, but he could come and be a sergeant in our unit. Uh, he had uh, uh, a unique way of uh, waking people up in the morning. The lights went on every morning at 5.30, and uh, he would go around to every bunk, and uh, if anybody was still not up, he would lift his palm upward stare at the bunk and say, rise. Uh, there was something about the way he said that, that just, if you were just stolid, stone, sound asleep, something in that voice cut through it, you knew you better get up. If, however, you didn't get up, he would say again, rise. And if you didn't get up the second time, you knew he was going to pick up your bunk, flip it upside down, and throw you out onto the ground. And that, by that time, he pretty much got your attention. You were ready to go. Now, we read about a, another kind of rising in uh, the New Testament. Jesus uh, raised uh, people from the dead. And in the early days of the Christian church, the church had authority even over death in some circumstances as well. Once the ball got rolling, those gifts most people have believed for the last 1900 years went out uh, with the end of the uh, uh, apostles, the apostolic era. Uh, some people believe they came back in, in uh, uh, a revival in Los Angeles uh, to the church uh, in the early part of the 20th century. But, but what we're going to take a look at now is another form of rising up, and that uh, takes place in the Bible's book of Acts. Acts is the church's uh, 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 handbook on evangelism. Uh, it's the um, uh, historical description of the first early days of the Christian church. Uh, Peter uh, is out and about, and uh, he is uh, at a place called Joppa, uh, where there was a disciple whose name was Tabitha which in Greek is Dorcas. This is from uh, Acts chapter 9, beginning at the 36th verse. She was devoted to good works and acts of charity. At that time, she became ill and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in a room upstairs. Since Lida was near Joppa, the disciples who heard that Peter was there sent two men to him with the request, please come to us without delay. So Peter got up and went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the room upstairs. All the windows stood beside him. All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other clo clothing that Dorcas had made while she was with them. Peter put all of them outside, and then he knelt down and prayed. He turned to the body and said, Tabitha, get up. Then she opened her eyes. And seeing Peter, she sat up. He gave her his hand and helped her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he showed her to be alive. This became known throughout Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Meanwhile, he stayed in Joppa for some time with a certain Simon, a tanner. Oh, isn't that interesting, that last sentence that gets kind of tacked on there? Yeah, well, he raised somebody from the dead, and then he kind of hung around for a little while, and he stayed with Simon the tanner. That says, I think, something about the, the nature of how commonplace this was, how, okay, at the time this was written, it was almost incidental, uh, the power of God at work in the early Christian movement. But it also said something about Peter. He didn't stay with, uh, with the high and mighty, the wealthy. Maybe there weren't any in the church at that time. He stayed with a tanner, uh, someone who uh, made uh, cloth out of, or, or leather out of uh, animal skins. Not a very highly respected 
profession. And yet Peter, who was himself a tent maker, perhaps had something to discuss and learn from uh, about uh, his craft from this, uh, this tent maker. Peter was a man of the people. He was a common uh, man who desired that uh, nothing more than that people come to a living relationship with the living God. Acts uh, is one story like this after another. I've often thought it would be a great adventure movie. People getting stoned to death, people getting chased out of town by angry mobs, shipwrecked, uh, tortured, executed, uh, but faithful nevertheless uh, day after day as the church grew and grew. Uh, on the day of Pentecost, that church that was being described, it is described in the book of Acts, was a, a, a church of, of nobodies, a, a church of people who didn't know each other or much about God until the Holy Spirit opened their hearts and minds to understand who Jesus actually was and, and what his death on the cross meant for all of humanity. The, the interesting thing about how that took place is that in the Genesis, we get a story about how there became divisions among all the peoples, that, that there was a, uh, a one people who decided they would build a tower big enough to reach the heavens. God saw their pride, their, their belief they could take over from God, so he broke the, the tower and confused their languages. On the day of Pentecost, that confusion is reversed. Now everybody hears in their own language the words of these untutored, uneducated Galileans telling the story of the gospel. The church begins in unity as an inclusive community sent now into the world to go and proclaim this great good news of reconciliation with God, not by earning it, but by receiving it as a free gift of God's grace in Jesus Christ because of the cross. So how do we live that out? How do we reopen? How do we become again that inclusive Christian community that the church has, has had been successful or less successful uh, uh, doing over the course of its 2,000 year history? My hero, Lyle Schaller, church development guy, uh, once said, uh, and I said this myself, people often have said that the seven last words of the church are, we've never done it that way before. But he said, when, when people say that, it's important not to simply dismiss it as fear of change. When people say, we've never done it that way before, it's a way of saying, this is who we are. That's why change is difficult, because it addresses us at a level of who we are. We can only come out of that by first defining ourselves by whose we are. We have a common relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, uh, a living relationship with a living God. And that's what makes us one in Christ. That alone is, is a unifier beyond anything else because it doesn't come from us, doesn't require our effort or, or accomplishment. It's a free gift from God. If only we ho hold it, hold open our hearts and receive what God is giving us in Jesus Christ. So how do we become more a movement of the Holy Spirit as a church and less as a corporate institution? How do we address the issues of racial injustice in our country? I don't think it's going to be a program. It's not going to be a, like check off this list. Uh, we have to learn to loosen the very ties that bind us together, that make us comfortable, that help us think of the church as a family in order to broaden our definition of family and make room for people who are not already like us or we don't think are like us to come and, and become a part of our common ministry, to identify with our common relationship with God being more important than anything else, anything else that, that, that would divide us. There has to be room for people to enter. We can't just do a program and figure we've done our bit. We have to do more listening than talking. We have to be more asking than giving answers. We have to be about more than just contemplation, although it is contemplation and necessary. We have to be also about action. We have to be the people of God. I read a story, uh, uh, rather I, I read a book uh, years ago called The Rise of Christianity. Uh, it's referenced in the, in the description of, of this uh, video. It's by a Christian sociologist named Rodney Stark, uh, one of the few uh, best books, along with the one we talked about last time. Uh, of uh, describing the, the state of the church and how the church can once again become uh, a, 
a growing force in, in our culture and our community uh, that I know. Uh, in it, Rodney Stark uh, did studies of early church membership records. Uh, the Romans, being an empire, did very good record keeping and the church reflected that structure in its own structure as, as it grew. It kept good records. And so he went in thinking he was going to see church growing, 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 oh, persecution, church shrinking, 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 shrinking. Then persecution ends, growing, 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 growing. The, the Christian church had been persecuted because of, it was intolerant. That was the charge of the empire. The empire couldn't stand intolerance. It needed cohesion. And so when the church said, nope, there's only one God, and the empire believed there were many, many gods, and you could believe in any god you wished, as long as you believed at one point that the emperor was also god, that that was the glue that held the empire together, they believed, you're okay. But when the church said, and the Jews said, nope, only one god, that's when they got into trouble with the empire. How did that change? Well, it changed gradually, exponentially. He said when he actually discovered the records, he said that the church grew pretty consistently, two or three percent a year for, for decades, sometimes a little lower, sometimes a little higher. Decades turned into centuries, centuries turned into three centuries in which at the end of those three centuries the church had become recognized as the official religion of the Roman Empire. What made things change? He said that the, the church, uh, there are many reasons, there are practical reasons like one God, okay, only one set of holidays one set of offerings. Many gods, lots of holidays, who can keep track? Lots of offerings to pay. So there's that practical uh, sense. The church also provided a sense of uh, hope for the future, that uh, someday, whatever happened in this world uh, to us, we would be joined together uh, in a living relationship with the living God that was brought to perfection. It started now, brought to perfection in the life to come forever. But the thing that really convinced people was the behavior of Christians. When there were pandemics, the Christians didn't get out of town. Everybody who had any money at all in the Roman Empire had a little place out in the country, and they'd go there and hide when, when there was uh, some kind of contagion in the cities. Christians didn't do that. They stayed. They took care of their own. They took care of others who weren't even Christians, nursed them back to health. When there was no more room in their uh, own homes, they began the world's first hospitals. That made an impression on, on the, the Roman culture. When Romans uh, had unwanted children, usually girls, uh, they would put them out in the woods and go away. And they would um, rationalize, comfort themselves by saying, well, if the God wants the child to live, it'll live. If the gods want the child to die, it'll die. I'm off the hook. Christians would go out and, and take those children in and raise them. And when they had no more room in their homes, they built the world's first orphanages. Uh, Christians' high regard for life, high regard for women combined here, and, and the role of women within the uh, church uh, was, was also very impressive to the, to the Romans. The, it was how the, the, the Christians lived that first got the attention. Of, of the Roman Empire, and that's why the church could grow and grow and grow, could keep going even times of persecution, death, torture, uh, the, the, the things that happened to them, uh, the horrific things, did not dissuade the people from believing that, that God had entered into human history, suffered and died in order to reconcile all who believe in him to, to life everlasting, a relationship begun now and continued in the, in the life to come in its perfection. We are heirs of that promise. That is the mission that, that we have been given and called upon to go out and, and, and accomplish. The early church was known for what it did more than, oh, that's their building, or I don't know what goes on in there. It's kind of weird, uh, I guess, but they're sort of nice people. I know one um, that, that we've kind of come to today. It's difficult for people to enter our churches, many of our churches, and, and, and feel that they belong there simply because they love God or because they want to love God. And, and they're imperfect and they don't know the rules, but they, they want to, to, to come to that relationship. It's, it, it, it's so odd for, for us. We don't know how to handle that. How do we? Well, I, I read a, a story uh, recently about an Indian from India, evangelist, who had had great success in reaching university students. Some uh, churches asked him, 
Uh, they, they had never had any success or recently with university students for generations. They wondered how he did it. Could, did he have a program that, that they could follow? And he says, no, there's no program. And they said, well, how, how do you attract so many students? He said, I just love them until they ask me why. Now that's a very good approach to evangelism, especially in a world that is often hostile to the Christian church, that has very little interest in seeking the church out, even for, for spiritual growth or development, that sees it as an aged and uh, irrelevant institution, boring, uh, something that uh, has no uh, significance for their lives. Love them until they ask you why. What if that's what we did? What if that was the, the content of our evangelism program? What if Jesus were to say to the church, rise up, rise the rise of the Christian church is, is, is always coming. We're always reforming. We're always becoming something new because we ourselves have become new in Jesus Christ. To be the church in these times offers us a tremendous opportunity for us to love people until they ask us why, for us to embody what it means to, to serve as we have first been served by a servant God to rise up and be the church. Each time we spend together, we spend some time in prayer. And today I'd like to, uh, to offer some prayers from some re requests and a general prayer for the times we're in, uh, and then uh, close with the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. We pray for all those caring for those with the coronavirus, those who now have it, and those in danger of get it, getting it. We pray for all those who have uh, struggle to understand what it is the church is to be about and how to go about being about it. We, we pray that your Holy Spirit might, might come down upon all of your people, Lord, throughout the world, that we might experience your power and accomplish all that you would have us do, not, not because we think it's a good program, but because we are following your lead and your inspiration and the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray for all those who provide essential services and those who seek the common good. We pray for those struggling for racial equality and those who protect and serve. We pray for those who seek to derail the efforts of people of goodwill, that their hearts may turn from destruction and toward the building up of all people. We pray for those struggling with all forms of violence, with mental health issues, and with substance abuse. We pray for those most vulnerable among us, for those who feel insecurities of any kind, and for the leaders of our government and of our church. And toward this end, may we be your instruments, Lord. We bring before you the requests that have been made known to us. For one's grandson, for thanks that he tested COVID-19 free for successful major surgery this week to remove two cancerous tumors from his liver and a non-functioning gland. We pray for Mario for healing of coronavirus, for peace, and for God's continued presence for him. For Dean George Pindua and his son, for continued healing of the coronavirus and protection for his family and for his church. And for one's mother for healing of cancer, and for her and her extended family for peace in your presence and promise. All these things, and whatever else you know that we need, we bring before you in the words of the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. So I'm just going to close with a blessing in a few minutes. I just want to remind us all to stay hydrated, to walk in that a stream of living water that is God's presence within us, all of us, and all of us together, to allow that living water to shape and renew us. To remember your church, identify with one if you don't already have one, to pray for your pastor and for your church leaders, to make sure that there is a church there for you when we return. If you are th having thoughts of suicide or mental health struggles, we, we ask implore you to reach out to someone, talk to somebody, talk to a professional, talk to a friend, talk to someone you know. People do love you and they want to care for you. Remember to wear your masks, practice social distancing, wash your hands and disinfect them frequently. That's a ministry, caring for others as, 
as, as secondarily to ourselves. Finally, be kind to everyone. Each of us is struggling in different ways. Be a person who is the light, uh, reflector of the light to this world at this time. And at this time, I'd invite uh, Sally to come and bring us a word of encouragement and, uh, and our benediction. This morning, uh, on the news, I heard that masks are so important, but that the deaf and hearing impaired community are having a lot of trouble. And they're trying to devise right now those who are doing masks for us and inventing safer ones and better ones to find masks that we can wear so that people can read our lips and, and listen to us um, this way as well uh, as just um, maybe with facial expressions or with our hands, but they can actually hear us. When I was preaching years ago on a text that Jesus, one of his parables, he said, those who have ears, let them hear. I was really struggling with it, and I remembered um, something growing up in an urban church in St. Louis that had a deaf community from the St. Louis Institute of the Deaf. We had a, It was very near, and we had about, I guess, two or 300 people in our congregation um, who were our members and our friends, but who were non-hearing. Or, or severely hearing impaired. And one of uh, my best friends there in Sunday school I had parents who were deaf. She was not. And um, I called home to my mother, and she reminded me of something. And I said, I'm going to do something with this mom, and I'm not sure. And she said, well, Betsy's parents uh, were very concerned, and St. Louis Institute of the Deaf said, don't be concerned. It'll be okay. We have programs for if your child is hearing, and and, and you're not, um, We this will be fine. This has happened before. We ha you'll have a group of people that will work with you, and you'll have friends. And So Betsy was born, and they brought her home from the hospital, and that very first night, and she was so worried, you know, when how she, would she know when Betsy woke up, when she was hungry, when she would need her. And that very night, about, oh, midnight, she woke up and looked over at the at the bassinet next to her where Betsy was just now waking up. And she began to cry a little. And her mother knew then. Her mother knew then. They meant she'd be listening with her heart. That whatever and whenever Betsy would need her, she would know. She would hear with her heart. I think that's so very important that right now for us to uh, be listening with the heart. That uh, our hearts are breaking now. Our hearts are actually growing now and expanding and reaching out to others in spite of whatever has happened in brokenness, they're being healed in the heart of Christ. And so, so now, as the earth keeps turning, hurtling through space, and night falls and day breaks from land to land, let us remember people waking, sleeping, being born and dying. Let us go forth with hearts that listen in the peace of Christ. Amen. <laughs>